Howdy, it's Kyle talking about the climate of the contiguous U.S. And with the land mass the size of the U.S., you can of course expect a lot of different types of climate throughout the country. And in this video, I'm going to talk about why different regions get different types of climate. So why you have different types of precipitation and temperatures and weather hazards in this part of the country, but not the next. I believe the climate is the most important aspect of where you live. It affects every aspect of your life, what you're going to be able to do that day, what you're wearing that day. And of course, you go out and talk to somebody randomly on the street. The first thing you're going to talk about is the weather because it's just so important. So in this video, I'm going to answer the question, why is the climate like that? The two most important geographic aspects that affect the climate of the U.S. are the ocean currents and the north-south orientation of the mountain ranges of North America. And the combination of these two aspects are what leads to the vast array of different climate types throughout the country. In the northern hemisphere, the ocean currents move in a clockwise direction. So that's why along the east coast or the gulf coast, you have very warm water because it's being brought up from the tropical areas, as opposed to the west coast where the water is significantly colder because it's being brought down from Alaska. So you can be as far south as San Diego and the ocean temperatures are going to be in the 60s. And up around San Francisco, the ocean temperatures are going to be in the 50s. So that's pretty chilly. Compare that to, say, the Carolinas where the ocean temperature is going to be in the 70s and Florida and South Texas where the ocean temperature is going to be in the 80s. So it's going to be a lot warmer on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast. And you can go as far north as New York and New Jersey and the ocean temperatures are still pretty pleasant. I'm going to begin discussing the different climates in the U.S. by starting from the West and moving East because in the mid latitudes here in North America, we're in a westerly wind belt. So that's the way that the weather generally moves. The coastal areas of Southern and Central California are generally considered to have the best climate in the world. Well, why is that? Why is the weather so much nicer in California than other places? Well, in the westerly wind belt, all of the weather affecting California is coming directly from the Pacific Ocean. And with that water being so cold during the summertime, it really has a moderating effect on the land. So it doesn't really get that terribly hot because you just have this cold ocean breeze always affecting the land, which keeps it much more moderate. In the wintertime, it's the exact opposite. So with the ocean temperature being warmer than the land, it also helps to keep moderate the temperature during the wintertime. But of course, during the winter, the difference in sea surface and land temperature isn't as great. And how this affects precipitation is that during the summertime, you're really not going to get any along the West Coast. Even as far north as Seattle, you really get no rain during the summertime. It's gorgeous. And we all know Seattle is a place that's gray and rainy all winter long, but in the summertime, it's gorgeous. So the only rain you're really going to get along the West Coast is going to be from the winter or to the spring. And of course, if you're farther north, the rain will start earlier, maybe the late fall and last longer, maybe to the mid spring. But you're going to have very nice summers no matter where you go. But of course, the farther north you go, the more rain you're going to get during the winter. So the coastal areas of Washington, Oregon, and Northern California are going to have a lot more rain because you have colder air masses. And a colder air mass is able to hold less moisture, so this can't hold on as long before it has to rain. The farther south you go, uh, the warmer the air masses are, it can hold a little more moisture, so it takes a little bit more before it starts to rain. So you can often get almost no rain at all along the Southern California coast. Along the west coast, it doesn't take very long for an air mass to move inland before it becomes affected by the mountain ranges. So it comes in and immediately hits the coastal ranges. And as it does, it has to rise. And as it rises, it cools, it condenses, and colder air can hold less moisture. So it just dumps all that rain or snow along the western slopes or the windward side of the mountains. That's why on the windward side, you're going to have a lot of greenery and trees. And of course, you have the biggest and tallest trees in the world in California. Those are on the windward side of the Sierra Nevada. But once you get to the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada or the Cascades is where things change a lot because the atmosphere dumped all that moisture on the west side. There's none of it left for the east side. Once you get to the eastern slopes of the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada is where you start to get into deserts. There's very little vegetation at all. And what you do have is usually zero fitted, kind of like cacti. It just doesn't need very much water at all. has very deep roots to get to the very limit of water there is. And you also have very extreme temperature ranges. So you don't have the you know, the coastal air masses affecting these areas east of the mountains. So you have very, very hot summers and very cold winters. East of the Rockies is where things really start to change because once you get into the Great Plains, you no longer have any mountain ranges that are there to stop and affect any of the air masses. So you have different air masses from different parts of the continent that are colliding. The western part of the Great Plains are very dry. You have, you know, short grass prairie. There isn't much precipitation there. And as you generally move east, you get more and more precipitation. It gets more and more green. You have the you know, the tall grass prairie in the eastern part of the Great Plains, and this gets more and more green as you head east. And the reason for that is that you have a lot of the warmer air masses from the Gulf of Mexico that are able to come up into the middle part of the country. And again, there's no mountain range there to stop it. So it just it brings in that warm, moist air from the Gulf, and this creates more humid temperatures, a little bit more moisture, a little more precipitation, and more greenery. 
But having no mountain ranges there also allows the really cold, dry air masses from Canada and the polar areas to come into the middle part of the country as well. So what happens is you have these really cold, dry air masses from the north mixing with these warm, moist air masses from the Gulf of Mexico, and they collide right in the middle of the country. And when these two collide, if the differences in temperature are great, you can get a really strong storm. And so the greater the temperature difference, the greater the pressure differences between the two, the stronger the storm's gonna be. And of course, in the Great Plains, this is where you get giant thunderstorms. And you got these, you know, these giant air masses that collide, you got these really warm ones mixing with these really cold ones, makes the air very unstable, makes it really exciting from an atmospheric standpoint, but can, but can create pretty severe storms, including tornadoes. Back in 2011, there was a huge tornado outbreak in the southeast, and there was a tornado that hit just a few miles from our house, and it was a, you know, a small tornado, if you can really even use that term. It was an EF0, but, you know, I'm standing on the back porch, and it was kind of cold and dry, and then a couple minutes later, it was warm and moist, and then back to cold and dry. It was just going back and forth, and I was like, oh, man, this isn't good. This is going to be, a, this is going to be bad. It's kind of like, you know, drink a lot of beer, drink a lot of liquor, everything gets in your stomach, it's real like that, and at some point, you're going to just have to throw up. And that's kind of what a tornado is. The atmosphere becomes so unstable, these two air masses colliding. You know, a tornado is basically the atmosphere throwing up. And the U.S. is by far the number one spot in the world for tornadoes. There's nowhere else on Earth that comes anywhere near as close as we have to the number of tornadoes that we get. And again, it's because of the mountain ranges. You look at the other major mountain ranges, in the Northern Hemisphere, the Alps are east-west oriented, the Himalayas are east-west oriented, the Pamirs, all these major mountain ranges are east-west. So what that does is it keeps the colder air masses from the polar areas from mixing with the warmer air masses in the tropical areas. And if we don't have this mix, you don't have the instability of the air, you don't have as much throwing up to create tornadoes. So you can get tornadoes in other parts of the world, but the vast majority of them are going to be here in the U.S. Just this century, what's considered Tornado Alley has changed a little bit. It used to be almost exclusively the Great Plains as far north as the Dakotas or Nebraska, but it's shifted a little more south and east to where Mississippi and Alabama are just as bad as Oklahoma and Texas in terms of tornadoes. And you know, it can be more of a risk in the southeast, actually, because you know, a lot less people have basements for protection and a lot more folks live in mobile homes. So in the Midwest, people are more used to these big tornadoes and they have more likely to have a basement and are less likely to live in a mobile home. So the risk isn't quite as there. So it's, it's been pretty bad in Mississippi and Alabama in recent years, and it's only going to probably get worse. But it isn't all bad with all of the moisture and the humidity you get in the east. You have a lot more precipitation. You have a lot more greenery. So you get to places like Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky. They're just gorgeous. They're green wherever you go. So you just have a lot more rain that can cause a lot more vegetation to grow. And once you get to the Gulf Coast or the southeast, you have that really high humidity to go along with the very high temperatures, which makes summers almost unbearable at times. But you can't always use the measurement relative humidity to determine just how uncomfortable it's going to be during the summertime because technically San Francisco is one of the most humid cities in the country. But because it's usually in the 50s and 60s there, you don't notice it as much as opposed to, say, New Orleans, which might not actually be as humid as San Francisco, but it'll sure feel like it is. Dew point is a much more accurate measurement of how uncomfortable it is or in terms of the heat index. Relative humidity is literally the difference between the temperature and the dew point. So if they're very close to each other, it's very humid. So again, San Francisco might be 60 degrees. The dew point might be 50. That's very, very humid because they're very close to each other as opposed to, say, the southeast where it might be 90 degrees with a dew point of 70. So the spread is much larger, but it's going to feel much more uncomfortable because the dew point is a lot higher. Or you could have somewhere like Las Vegas where the temperature might be 115 with a dew point of 10 or some kind of ridiculous spray like that, which is a really good indication that it's very dry. And when I was in college, I had a meteorology professor. I asked him, you know, what's your favorite weather? He's like, I don't really care what the temperature is as long as the dew point is 50. But of course, that warm water off the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico is why you can get hurricanes during the summer or fall. And, you know, the entire Southeast faces a significant hurricane risk every single year. Uh, hurricanes need very warm water to be fed. That's what keeps them going. So the warmer the water is going to be the stronger the storm. And so that's why you don't really get any hurricanes off the West Coast because the water is just too cold. And the reason why you get so many hurricanes in the summer and fall is because, again, with the specific heat of water being so much higher, it takes longer for the ocean water to warm up. So the ocean water is still very, very warm by October. So you do have a significant hurricane threat in October, even though it's very, very small in May or really even June. And of course, the farther north you go, the colder it's going to get, and the higher the chance of precipitation is going to be snow. But not everywhere in the north has the same type of cold temperatures or the same amount of snow. 
winters in the northern Great Plains are going to be colder than the winters of New England, even though they're at the same latitude. And the reason is, again, because of these cold polar air masses. So what happens is these cold air masses are coming straight down from Canada, going right into the Midwest, and just causes it to be super, super cold during the winter, very high winds, even though you don't really get that much snow. The Northeast is affected more by the ocean temperatures. So the oceans are very cold in the wintertime in the Northeast, but it is still more of a moderating influence. So you don't have it quite as cold in Maine or New Massachusetts as it does in, say, Minnesota or North Dakota, but it obviously it's still very cold. But you do get more snow in the Northeast than the Midwest. You could be as far north as eastern Montana or North Dakota, and you won't have that much snow. There might be a light dusting while it's minus 25 degrees, as opposed to, say, Boston, where you might have a foot of snow, even though it's a toasty 12 degrees. And then you have lake effect snow, which is literally how it sounds. It's snow that's affected by the giant lakes. What happens during the wintertime is, you know, the air is moving from west to east, and it's going across these giant lakes. And during the wintertime, even though the water is very cold, it's still warmer than the land. So it's relatively warm air masses carrying a lot of moisture. And it says hauling, going across these lakes. There's no friction at all, nothing slowing them down. And all of a sudden, it hits the land. The land is much colder. Colder air can hold less moisture, so it has nowhere to go. It's now got friction, has to stop. It can't hold any more moisture. and just dumps a ton of snow. So the eastern side of some of these Great Lakes is where you can get tremendous amounts of snow, especially in upstate New York, like Buffalo or Rochester or Syracuse. It's just ridiculous amount of snow. And when I was in college, I had a roommate that was from Rochester. He would tell me these stories about the snow. And I was like, oh, it doesn't snow six to eight feet. I mean, come on. No, it snows six to eight feet sometimes. So... I mean, that's incredible snow, but you can be on the western side of the Great Lakes and it's going to be cold and snowy, but nowhere near as much snow as you're going to get on the eastern side of the Great Lakes. And you might be wondering why you get so much more snow in upstate New York, even though Lake Erie and Ontario are a lot smaller than Lake Michigan. Why don't you have as much lake effect snow on the eastern shores of Lake Michigan? Well, Michigan's a north-south oriented lake. It's not that terribly wide east-west, whereas Erie and Ontario are east-west oriented lakes, so there's much more distance for the air masses to cross, more time for it to pick up speed, pick up more moisture, and which just you know gives it more moisture, more snow to dump on the eastern shores of Lake Erie and Ontario. But the summers in the Midwest are going to be nicer than the summers in the Northeast, because again, with it being less moisture, it's less humid, and it's just more pleasant during the summer, you can be as far northeast as New York City, and it might as well be Georgia in August, because it's just so hot and humid. So you have a little bit less pleasant summers in the Northeast, as opposed to the Midwest. You have a lot more snow, it's not quite as cold. The upper Midwest gets way colder and way windier, not quite as much snow, better summers. So six of one, half dozen of the other, either way, winters are going to suck. So that's just a real quick overview of the climate of the contiguous U.S. And of course, there are a lot more details and nuances than that, but I just wanted to go over some of the basics. And wherever you're going to live in the country, you're going to have to put up some kind of crappy weather at some point or another. I mean, with the exception of the coastal areas of Southern California, I mean, it's going to be horrible at some point in the year. So it comes down to what you are willing to put up with. Big snow, heavy winds, hot, humid summers, high temperatures, the desert, lots of rain during the winter, severe thunderstorms, hurricanes, whatever you're going to you're able to tolerate, you have to tolerate something. So, you know, of course, again, if you live in LA, it's always nice, but everything else there sucks. So, but, you know, in the Southeast where I live, you know, my, my biggest complaint is that it's rarely nice. I mean, you have like a, maybe a month of nice weather in the spring, maybe a month of nice weather in the fall. The rest of the year is not, not nice at all. So, I don't know. I think the climate, again, is very important. It affects every day of your life, affects your lifestyle, affects what you're going to do. So, you know, I just think it's really important to understand the climate of the U.S. and why different places have different climate than others. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And if you're interested in stuff like this, subscribe to this channel because I'm posting stuff about U.S. geography, road tripping, just kind of nerdy travel stuff too. So yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King signing out.